Greetings. We're about to embark on a wonderful journey looking at the life and ministry of William Williams of Panticelli. And in this message, we're going to get an overview of the man, of his character, of his faith. Look at the nation of Wells and the times in which he lived. Why should we spend any time at all in considering such a man? And then finish it off by looking at what is called experiential Christianity. Experiential Christianity. So, who is this William Williams of Panticelli? Well, he was used in a mighty way by the Lord. A great Welsh Calvinistic preacher, without a doubt. I would consider him to be a theologian. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that uh, this man was the Jonathan Edwards of the Welsh people. Yes, indeed. I know he was influenced a great deal by Wells. A profound writer. A writer of many hymns. Hundreds. Maybe even a thousand. In fact, he published a set of his hymns. And God used it to bring about one of the revivals. Between 1735 and 1835, there's about six or seven revivals. And God used Mr. Williams' hymnal book as a means to bring about revival. That's certainly no surprise. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that when uh, he needed to rest, he was weary, fatigued. I think it was around 1946, 47, perhaps. And during his time away to restore his soul, he sought the Lord. And he was reading William Williams' uh, hymnals. And his soul was restored. He credits William Williams, a, a particular hymn to, of, of restoration, of, of regaining his strength. And he said of William's work, it is great poetry and perfect theology. Great poetry and perfect theology. Mm. Yes. So, great preacher, Great writer, profound hymnals, great poetry, perfect theology, a sense of an historian, and a spiritual counselor. He had a true shepherd's heart. Now, think about this for a second. What does it say about us that this man, who all of Wells, and truly all of Christianity, have a debt, should have a debt of gratitude towards him. And what does it say about us that we have forgotten such a man? How many blessings are we not realizing? Because we know nothing about his hymns, or his preaching, or his other writing. Totally forgotten, by and large. Do you see the problem? See, we have much in common. Why should we study such a man? Because he can help us in our pilgrimage, going from this world to God's celestial city. You see, when William Williams was born in 1717, before the great revivals of 1735, he would call it, it is the darkest hour. Why? Because the Welsh people were lost and dead in their sins, getting drunk, playing games, distracting one another. They were superstitious people. They had no knowledge of the gospel. They just thought perhaps maybe meritorious works will make me right with God, that God will accept me just the way that I am. They wouldn't spend nights reading the Bible. They would spend nights entertaining one another to death by telling each other horror stories and ghost stories, ghosts and goblins. Well, are we not doing that today? You might say, well, no, John, we're not doing that today. We don't spend time telling ghost stories. Well, yeah, we do. We just do it in a different way. We go to movies, these filthy, disgusting movies, all these horror movies and ghost stories. Yes. So there is much that we can learn and we can be encouraged because as sin was on the rise and getting the best and shipwrecking people's lives and faith, 
God moved graciously in a powerful way six or seven times, like I said, between 1735 and 1835. And William Williams lived through most of that, being born in 1717 and went home to glory in 1791. In fact, he would outlive Hal Harris, who passed in 1773, and Daniel Rowland by one year, who died in 1790. But my point is that these men, these colleagues, these foot soldiers together in the faith, preached a powerful gospel. And it was difficult to travel. Just like for Hal Harris, William Williams had to deal with the road conditions, which were terrible. And of course, Wells is very rural. And the signage, road signs, highly undependable, (laughs) easy to get lost. But thankfully, William Williams knew the back roads, knew how best to get from one place to another, because the Welsh people were committed to helping people come to saving faith in the Lord, and they spoke the truth. That was a characteristic. They spoke the truth. See, they were Calvinistic, meaning that they wanted the whole counsel of God. They wanted to help the Anglican Church get back to true Christianity, the Christianity that we see in the book of Acts as an example. But they're concerned about the whole counsel of God. And as William Williams was traveling around, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't say to people, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're not in Christ's way, it means you're lost, which is why I'm here, to help you. If you don't know God's truth, it means you're wrong. It means you're wrong. You need to humble yourself and see the errors of your ways and the bondage of your sin. For Christ has come into this world to deliver you from it. And if you're not in Christ's life, if the life of Christ is not in your soul, well, then you are dead in your sins. And what you need more than anything else is the life of God in your soul. So you're not in bondage anymore. And there was great opposition against William Williams, just like there's opposition against you and me. It's not paranoid to say that you and I are lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers in Satan's kingdom because we're not listening to what he's telling us. You're not supposed to get in your car and go to a Sunday service to worship the living God. You're not supposed to go to prayer meetings. You're not supposed to go to Bible study. You're not supposed to serve the Lord in a whole variety of ways. You're not to think of others. You're to think of yourself. You're not to open up the book. God's book, you're not to graze on that. You're not to strengthen your faith or gain assurance. No, there's this constant opposition. Constant opposition, just like there was in William Williams' day. As I said, he called it the darkest hour. But then God then moved. And let that be an encouragement to us that we can seek the Lord, we can press in, that we can pray continually, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. For we need you, Lord, your spirit to move in such a way that as we share the gospel, it will break our stubbornness. It will bend us, O Lord, bend us, O Lord, to your will that we would be able to see the truth. So William Williams can help us in many ways, if you will, in the negative, in the sense of, seeing the opposition that is against us and how to overcome those snares and traps, but also in the positive, returning back to true experiential Christianity. You see, the Anglican church is guilty of malpractice. When you think about Wells, probably the size of Massachusetts, think about it as its own nation, as its own culture, its own language. The vast majority of people in William's day, they spoke Welsh, like 80, 90, 95%. And very few people spoke English. So you can understand the nonsense of the Anglican church sending ministers who can only speak English to people who don't know a lick of English. You see, uh, you can think about all the Bible verses where the Lord says, my people have no shepherd. So what is God doing? The Anglican Church, guilty of malpractice, the nonconformist, fall into all sorts of heresy, 
So the Lord is lifting up people within those groups and outside of those groups, farmers and cobblers and many others, saying, okay, if, if, uh, if my church, the Anglican church, is not going to preach my word, well, then I will find people who will. Yes, indeed. So he was helping them get back to experiential Christianity. And they would set up community groups, call them experiential meetings. In fact, William Williams wrote a book titled Experiential Meetings, and it was translated from Welsh into English by the doctor's wife, Beth Ann Lloyd-Jones. And you can buy the book today. I think perhaps from Manner of Truth, but certainly on eBay. And it's worth a read. And what you'll find is how wonderful basic it is. Since the last time we met would be one of the Christian one of the questions. What challenges have you faced and how have you overcome them? Since the last time we met, what challenges have you faced and how have you overcome them if you have? Do you see how biblical those questions are? The honesty, the transparency, We're not used to that today. I'm sure it was a challenge for them back then. But equally, it's a challenge today. I shared uh, this week that my soul was dry. Why? Because of all my distractions at work. I'm not going to get into it, but just the assignments and the work demands of life kept me out of God's word, kept me away from him in prayer. And it cost me. But the Lord was gracious with me. I got to church on Sunday morning to be with God's people, to hear his word preached so boldly and to sing to him and pray to him and to be reminded of the truth and the world quickly faded away. And all my anxieties, all my worries, all the distractions were eradicated. See, it's really important, Williams would say to us, that we confess our sins for he is faithful to forgive us and that we take our concerns, these spiritual challenges, and we turn them into action, that we draw closer to God as Apostle Paul reminds us, right? To press on, to keep on. Yes, indeed, that we don't want to wallow and just sit there in our anxiety, but we want to do something about it. Just like the doctor did when he was fatigued and downcast, perhaps. What, What did he do? He returned back to William Williams' hymns where there was perfect poetry and a profound and pure theology to remind me of God's truth. So that's where I'm going to leave it this week. I just wanted us to capture, who is this man? I think he's Jonathan Edwards of Wells. Great preacher, great theologian, profound writer, a writer of many hymns. We should go explore that. And a great shepherd, because he was a good spiritual counselor and one who wasn't afraid to work and labor by by traveling the back roads of wells and all the terrible weather conditions and road conditions, just like Hal Harris. And then, of course, then he had to deal with the opposition, the violence, the threats. Yes, indeed. But he used all of his gifts that God has given him to advance the gospel message. He did the work, right? So it's kind of like the, like the, the prophets, you know, when, you, when you, you labor and you, and you built the altar, but then you're calling on God to bring down fire from heaven. Well, likewise, let's you and I be faithful, be hardworking to apply ourselves like a William Williams did and call on God to bring down the fire. Do you see what I mean? We do the work. We do what the Lord tells us to do. But we trust Him to bring about the change, to bring about conviction. Because only by His Spirit can souls be saved. And William Williams knew that. He believed it. And his life represented it all in the efforts 
to bring people back to experiential Christianity, that we would have the life of God in our soul, and that we would cling to his truth. And that, I think, summarizes what we're going to learn by looking at this man's life. And going forward, uh, next week, we'll dive in further into some of these details. And I hope that this was a, a great encouragement and a blessing to you. Until next time, grace upon grace be with you all.